Hey, it's Joel. This is my workbench behind me. You've seen it in a few episodes, but this isn't about my workbench. It's about the thing that's off camera and you really need to see it. Come on, let's go. Here it is. This is it. The largest 3D printer I've ever had in my possession or used. This is the 3D Platform 300 Series Workbench Pro. It's one meter by one meter by 0.7 meter. It's dual extrusion and I've already broken it. Let's find out how it got here, what I've made, how I did that, and what the next steps are. And let's do it right here on 3D Printing Nerd. This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Head to brilliant.org forward slash 3D Printing Nerd and stick around to the end to find out lots more. There you are. Welcome back. Yes, this 300 series machine from 3D Platform is in my garage. I've had to rearrange quite a bit just to get it in here and it's already broken. This is a glass bed, and that's a major chunk of glass missing. And just right out of the gate, this is a $38,000 USD machine. It, it boggles my mind. It's industrial, it's wonderful, and they're letting me use it for a bit. So let's jump into how we got it in here because that is a story in itself. The 300 series normally ships in a large crate, and this was no exception. However, the shipping company didn't have a truck with a lift gate that could support the 2,000 pounds that everything weighed. So Don from 3D Platform unpacked the printer from the crate at the shipping facility and then used his van to bring it to my house. You got this, Don. There's this remote controlled winch system in the van and that helps in making sure the printer doesn't just roll away. I had to help move the printer out of the van and onto the lift gate that got it down to the ground and then it was just wheeled into my garage. Gantry ships rotated 90 degrees to ensure it's safe during traveling. All axes are screw drive with Y and Z having dual. The control box is huge and connects everything with D sub connectors. Next is the breaker box and it's a locking box that attaches to the side of the machine. The 300 series needs. 220, 30 amp. And boy, that's some serious power. The high flow extruder is water cooled and the radiator is attached to the side of the machine next to the breaker box. These shepherd's hooks are what guide the filament to the extruders. This paper covers a giant borosilicate glass build plate. It's roughly 41 inches by 42 inches and it's 3 16 inch thick. It's massive. Have a good look. It won't look like this for long. It takes 2.85 millimeter filament and those will unspool on their own if not careful. These acrylic discs hug the spools from either side keeping the filament in check. Filaments are fed up into the shepherd's hooks through filament sensors. The sensors are in series, so filament must be in both of them in order for the system to work properly. This is the HFE 300 hot end. It's a water-cooled plastics extrusion beast. The 300 in the name is for the 300 watt heater that it has. It comes standard with a one millimeter nozzle and there's a two millimeter nozzle I can swap in. Next to it is their HFA extruder smaller than the HFE and used when more detail is desired. How many customers have uh, broken their build plate? Disney about four times. Once the test is done, a dial indicator is attached to the X axis and used to help level the bed. Bed leveling is done with two adjustment screws in the corners and on the sides. One is a push and the other is a pull. They need to be adjusted in tandem to lock that section of the build plate in place. To say it's tedious, eh, that's an understatement. It does work though, and with the bed level, Don heads back out on the road and I get down to printing. Then I thought, I got this. I have profiles for Simplify 3D and I have Chuck's pawn. So I thought I would print it. Never mind that the head came off, but it turned out great. This is in PETG. It was on bare glass and I went to remove it and tragedy struck. And that's why there's that giant hole in the glass. For some reason, this PETG welded itself to that glass. There was no way it was coming off. I did try with some safety gear on to chip away the glass at the bottom of this. And if you look still, there's glass all over there. It would not, it would not come off. It would not. And so I'm left with a giant hole in the glass in this $38,000 machine. I thought what to do. So I got out my shop vac and I vacuumed up all the glass particles. And then I used some blue tape 
to kind of tape the sides because broken glass sides, edges are, are sharp and they can cut people. And then I thought, what can I do? What can I do? I had an idea. This is the BuildTac spring steel from my old G-Max 1.5 XT Plus. Still has the BuildTac on it and I want you to take a look at this because just the, the size of this machine is fascinating. I thought, you know what I can do? I can put this build plate right over there, tape it in place, and it'll cover it up. I won't have anything to worry about. And if you look at it, taking up the, the, that space where the hole was, there's still so much build area left over. The size of this machine, it just, it boggles my mind. There was still usable space though, and I thought I had an idea of something I could print, and it was relevant to events in the past, so I went for it. Can you grab it for me, Sean? Oh, geez, it's heavy. This you might recognize as being the OpenRC F1 front wing. And this is 4X scale for that giant car up there. You remember, originally, it crashed into the back of a Tesla. Go, 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 go! And it broke this wing. Here, let me go. I guess I should have had this down, huh? That was a broom. <laughs> Look at that. So it's missing that part and uh, oh, well, there goes sadness, that. Yeah. sadness. It never withstood the test of uh, a car crash. This one is PETG. It's quite heavy. Uh, uh, I think we have a better chance with this. So now with those axles from Siemens in metal, I think we have a chance of running that open RC again maybe a little faster and maybe less crashing this time. Maybe, we'll see. But for PETG, it was a little bit stringy. Uh, the PETG provided one gold and one red, it wasn't dried, and I didn't dry it before printing and it was popping as it was coming out the nozzle, but the strings were easily cleaned up with some clippers and a heat gun, and that's what we were left with. So Dawn from 3D Platform gave me a few rolls of this uh, Phil Kemp, Phil Kemp PLA. I was like, sure, why not? This machine chews through filament like crazy. A few rolls of material, always welcome. And I thought, what could I print with this? Well, in Simplify 3D, I know how to set vase mode, and I had a large section of build plate available. So, uh, <laughs> I went with this. So, that, uh, the wing, all one piece, PETG, took about 10 hours to print. This was similar, about 10 hours to print. It's, uh, it's huge. <laughs> this is a filament frenzy vase. This is in PLA, this is vase mode, and it's 1.2 millimeter extrusion widths, and it was, I did 0.3 millimeter height. The wing was 0.6 millimeter height, I believe. And one of the things you might notice, see if you can zoom in. So it's smooth right here. It's white, so it's gonna reflect a lot of light. Can you see it still? Yeah. Okay, so it's smooth here. It's a little bumpy up here. And uh, the reason is the gantry system, the bed stays still and the gantry system raises up. And so as you speed up, it's like two, two posts, right? It starts to kind of shake a little bit as the machine moves. So you have to slow the speed down. I didn't do that because I printed it overnight, but I still think it looks cool. It's, I mean, sturdy too. That's sturdy. This is like a cool vase. I could plant a tree in this thing. It's so big. <laughs> Team trees. This, this machine is industrial to say the least. Uh, screw drive on Y and on Z or Z. The X carriage uh, is driven with one motor. Uh, y and Z have these little transponders or something, but they, uh, Y and Z talk to each other and keep the motors in sync, just so that you always have motors that are turning at the, the same speed. It comes on this bench, which is just amazing. It's got drawers for all sorts of stuff. That one's locked, I'm not allowed in there. Don't worry, the key's over here. Filament though, uh, filament is crazy. We're actually gonna start a print really soon. I can't wait for you to see that. So filament spools are held down here. This giant metal cylinder is what holds the spools. And here are those acrylic discs to keep it from unraveling. The spools that it came with 
are huge and the machine can take five or 10 kilogram spools. Uh, this is 2.3. So what I wanna do now is I have some Polymaker PETG. It's been in my dryer. I'm gonna take it out, load it up, and I've made a special model that's quite functional. It's 200, it's a little over 200 millimeters wide. It's 100 millimeters tall, and it's supposed to take roughly two and a half hours to print. <laughs> that's just amazing. So I'm gonna get this all set up, and you'll get to see how we start a print on this thing. We'll see how it goes, we'll see if it works, and I can't wait for you to see it. Let's do it. A huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Brilliant is a problem-solving website and an app for your mobile device that helps you understand the laws that shape our reality through story-driven learning and interactive challenges. Being able to grasp math and science concepts is easier when the learning environment is fun and engaging. Personally, I've always understood and retained math and science knowledge when I learned it in a way that sparked my thinking. This is what Brilliant does. I have to tell you, the Quantum Objects course is the course I'm taking right now. And I'm a fan of the Ant-Man movies, and they talk about the quantum realm. <laughs> Plus, I've always been curious about the properties of subatomic particles and how their behaviors differ from my understanding of how the universe works. Turns out, <laughs> Although quantum mechanics can't quite help you time travel yet, the way Brilliant tells the story is fascinating. Go to brilliant.org forward slash 3D Printing Nerd to sign up for free. And the first 200 people who do so with my link get 20% off their annual premium membership. So these are the shepherd's hooks and the filament. Uh, I've cut this, I'm pulling it through just uh Look at how much filament that is. That's that's was all in the shepherd's hooks up into the filament sensor. That's cool. We're gonna replace it with some PETG from Polymaker. It's 285. This has been dried. And I'm going to snip the end. So let's see. Okay, we're gonna set this up. So I'm gonna put that on there. Let's stick that through that hole right there. I put on some tape because as the machine is moving, the metal on metal here was making a rattling sound and I thought tape would help and it did. <laughs> Come on. And that'll go on here. The uh, tape saved you. Tape saved me. Yay for tape. So, filament's gonna go on here, just like that. And I have some, like I mentioned, these are run in series. These are the filament sensors right here and right here. Uh, I have some filament in here just so that that one's triggered. And then I can put this one in here. Takes a little bit and then it'll come out the shepherd's hook. Ha <laughs> ha! There we go. I would imagine some people need a ladder to reach this. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> Pardon me. So to turn on the machine, the green button right here turns it on. Look at that. Uh, it's been homed. Uh, I'm going to move Z up just a little bit because I know filament's gonna be purging. And I'm going to heat, let's see, number two to 240 and the bed to 85. So this piece, you can kind of see on the inside, there's the gears that are turning. Uh, I took this, I took the screws out because a blob developed on this side and I couldn't pull it through. And so it's just easy enough to have it just kind of sitting right there. Not too bad. You can feel it already getting warm. So this is configured to print the model in the center and it's, uh, it's gonna go on here. So the, this flexible steel sheet is going to add to the height of the build plate, but I can use baby stepping to adjust the nozzle and it should print on here just fine. I do, however, need some blue tape. I'm just gonna tape it down. Nozzle's up to temperature as well, so let's, um, extrusion, 100 
five and extrude. So right now I'm purging the red PETG that was in there and out should flow some black PETG from Polymaker in just a moment. There it is. When this is extruding, this is a one millimeter nozzle and ex extruding the filament really fast. And so it's gonna maintain its heat for longer, which means that that's still gonna be kind of pliable and hot and hurt you if you touch it. It's, it's weird, it's, it follows a lot of the same principles of printing on an Ender 3 in your garage, but just embiggened. Okay, we've got filament loaded. I have the file on the SD card. I have the flexible steel sheet with build tack in the center covering the hole. I think it's time to print. So I'm gonna hit here. Yeah, yeah. HFE, PETG, uh, grumbler for two, that's it. Okay. Object height, 99.9 .9 millimeters, nice. And print. So it's gonna home X, Y, and Z or Z. And then it will purge the nozzle a little bit. It's gonna spit out some filament. Just as a precaution, I'm gonna stand here with clippers. And I'm just gonna get that little bit out there. So there we go, it's purged. Now it's homing itself again, and it should move to the middle and start printing that thing, at which point I'm going to man the baby step functionality. Getting to height, okay, doing something. Here we go. Okay, I'm a little low. Come on, get up there, get up there. Looks like, okay, we're a little too high now. So I'll bring it back down. That's know, not bad. I don't know, man, it's black on black. Yeah, I know. Sorry about that. It's printing. Let's go catch some lunch and then we'll be back and see how it looks. Tomorrow. Good morning. I know we said we were gonna come back here after lunch, but it was after lunch, dinner, shower and a shave, change of clothes and a coffee. It, this is wonderful. Here's the build plate that we were printing on. We ended up not doing that. There is a print done on the glass and I do wanna talk about that because that's the print we're gonna use. But first, this is the red button that turns it off. I believe it cuts the fans and the liquid cooling. Let's see. Ah, quieter. Okay, join me over here, please. Originally, when we started the print, we had it right here. And because of the, the temperature that the bed got to, and because it's spring steel, the bottom of the print wasn't looking as good as I wanted it to do. So I thought, you know what? I've got magic goo. It actually ships with it. And we could just print it over here. So we cut this and we took it off. And then I'm like, hey, Sean, try to remove it. <laughs> so anyway, it's really cool because now this is a permanent fixture to the build tech. So maybe doing that was a really good idea. I was scared at first because of what had happened right here, but when I printed this, there was magic on the table and it, it came off so easy. It came off so easy. If you look inside, so that is a bunch of uh, filament that shouldn't be there. And obviously, just like any consumer level 3D printer, we have to talk about flow rates, extrusion multipliers, retraction settings, temperature settings, speed settings, all of that. And so just like with any machine, this needs to be dialed in for the filament. I still have some filament left. I mean, you can see it coming out of the shepherd hook into the machine. And uh, this I should be able to, let's see. There we go. Some of it. It also looks like, uh, I don't know what's going on here. So there's a little bit of layer boogerness right there. That's the only way I can really think of describing it. And I think what's happening is I put a, a fillet on the inside just to kind of give a curved surface on the inside, kind of where these this edge meets this. And uh, well, I, I think that presented a problem because it did a little bit of infill and I don't know if I have it properly tuned, so that happened. But in the end, we're left with a print that looks like this. And here's what I was thinking. This is called a grumbler. It's half the size of a growler. It's a 32 ounce glass container. And when I go to my local pub to get a fill up of some, some beer or cider, I take one of these. And if I put it in my car in the seat, it kind of rattles around, it doesn't work so well. So I made this. 
This is my grumbler for two, and since I have two of these, I can put one in either side, and then this little section up here, you can keep a uh, wallet, credit cards, cash, a scraper, it really doesn't matter. It's just, it helps stabilize the whole thing, and at the same time, it lets you store some stuff. Uh, it's great. This was a functional print. I took 30 minutes in Fusion 360 just to kind of get my design down, and I designed it knowing the extrusion settings for this machine, and it came out really good. It's nice and strong. PETG, it's gonna last forever, and I'm gonna use this when I go get a fill up at the pub next. But this isn't the end, because this machine, as you can tell, prints amazingly huge things, and this is just the beginning. So I showed you the OpenRC F1 wing, and that was awesome. And I showed you Chep's pawn, the Film at Friday pawn that broke the glass, and that wasn't awesome, but it was awesome at the same time, because why not, right? And I've shown you the Filament Frenzy vase. That was really cool. I mean, if I packed that with soil, I could plant a freaking tree. Who knew? But in the end, I want to print some really cool things that I wouldn't have been able to print before. So we're looking at things like, should I print furniture with this? Would that be something you would want to see? Or James at X Robots currently has the world record for the largest 3D printed sculpture of a human. I could beat that with this. So is that something you would wanna see? Do you wanna see me get the world record from James? If so, let me know in the comments. I'm open to suggestions for this because I have some ideas on my own that I don't quite wanna tell you yet, but there's, uh, there's gonna be a lot of prints on this thing and I have it for a while, so let the ideas flow. And lastly, if you are a filament manufacturer, and you'd like to see your filament printed on this machine, get in contact with me. It takes 285 filament. I have hardened nozzles. I can take anything you can throw at me as long as it melts at 300 degrees Celsius or less. <laughs> well, if you made it this far, you're awesome. I'm really excited to showcase a lot of really cool stuff on this, and I can't wait to hear what you want me to print on this. And then, you know, for my After the Five Patreon supporters, we're gonna dive a little deeper and kind of go over some of the, the things that went wrong and went right with some of those prints. I look forward to seeing you there. But like I said, if you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more and from a safe distance, high five.